Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Diederik Stapel. So the first question could be, do you know me? And unfortunately for all the Dutch people in this train, you probably say, yes, I know you. But we never met. I don't know any one of you. So I guess the conclusion should be that you know of me. You've read about me. You've seen me on television. But you don't know who I am. So who am I? I'm Diederik Stapel. I'm committed scientific fraud. I changed and evented research data. And by doing that, I jeopardized the careers of many of my colleagues. And I betrayed their trust in me. In, in me. And I caused them pain and sorrow. That's who I am today. I invented data. I was fired from the university. And I spent two years at home being dazed and confused with pain and sorrow and trying to understand what I did and what happened. What happened? I tried to rebuild myself. I tried to pick up the pieces and I tried to make a new start. Why a new start? Why not disappear? Why not go up in smoke, stay in the cellar of our house and not appear anywhere else, never to be seen? Why? To show my children that life is worth living. Even when you fall, you can pick up the pieces and try to stand up. Even if you jump like I did from a 54 stories high skyscraper, you fall and you're in pieces, but you can try to pick them up piece by piece, it will take some time, and go on. This is my first, this is my first public appearance since all this happened. This is the first time I give a talk in a long, long, long time. I haven't spoken English for more than two years, and I'm pretty nervous. But you do good. Thank you. <laughs> And I tried to memorize this talk. I only heard I could give this talk a few days ago, but then it didn't work. So that's why you see me reading. It's against the TEDx uh, tradition, but please bear with me. Why did I make up research data and blew up my career as a scientist? Why? Well, today I want to talk about the importance of connectedness, of being connected, because that's something I lost and something I learned to appreciate more than ever in my life. There are many reasons why I did what I did, why I blew up my career and why I invented research data, but I think one of the more important reasons is that I became detached from myself. I lost my own interest, my inner self. I lost my dreams, my power, my passion, my desires. And in doing that, I also lost the connection with other people. I became a sleepwalker. Slowly over my career, step by step, day by day, week by week, year by year, my, my personal goals became less important than my professional goals. And my professional goal was only one goal. And that goal completely overtook me, and that made me become detached from myself. I became indifferent, and indifference is a terrible disease. I became indifferent, I was a sleepwalker, I didn't care. I was having fun, I was teaching, I was writing, I was thinking, I had wonderful colleagues, but I, myself, my true self, wasn't really there. I lost myself. And why? Because I got too goal-focused. My goal was too important and it was too single-minded. Of course, it's good to be goal-focused. If this train doesn't know where it's going, we don't get, get anywhere. And if you don't know what you want from life, it's not worth being alive. And of course, when you know where you want to go, it's easier to get there. It's extremely important to be goal-focused. But life is not about one goal. Life is about multiple goals. Life is a multiple goals game. There are many goals on the soccer field of life. There's not one for me and one for the enemy. There are many goals. And that's what I lost, this insight. What do we want from life? We want to love and we want to be loved. We want to find meaning and be meaningful. We want to connect and be connected. We want to be happy and make other people happy. Of course, we want to have fun and peace and world peace and help Obama and other people. 
and we want to save the planet and we want everybody to be happy. Of course. All these goals are important though. And they're important at the same time for the same people. And when you become like me, when you become goal obsessed, when one goal becomes more important than all the other goals, you become blind to the other goals. Focus on one thing and the other things are pushed away. And that's of course, that happens to many of us. Not in this, to the same extent as it happened to me or I did it. More profit, more sales, more clients, more patience, more shareholder value, more world peace, the great American novel, a new haircut, saving the planet. These are extremely important goals. But if they overpower all the other goals, you're lost. So goal focus is a good idea, but goal obsession is something very dangerous. In my professional life, I became obsessed with results, by finding answers, by finding what I expected to find, by finding what I thought was logical. That became my obsession and it pushed away all the other goals. It was my carrot that was in front of me and I was running behind the carrot and it wasn't there, of course, it was a moving target. And when I was chasing this carrot, all the other things above me, besides me, underneath me, became unimportant. I didn't see them. I didn't see them. I got blind. I got blinded by my goal. And I fell. I got lost. I got disconnected. And I fell on the floor and that was the end of me. Social connection is important because it makes us human. It's what makes us human, it's what defines us. We as human, a human species, we can talk, we can converse, we can share our thoughts like we do now today. And I think this is best illustrated that it defines us as human beings. But if you look at the Sixteen Chapel, where God creates the first man, the first human being, Adam, and he does so by pointing his finger, by connecting his finger, reaching out to Adam. And by touching the finger of Adam, he breathes life into human beings. He gives human beings an emotion, emotion, a soul. So social connection is important because it makes us, that's what defines us. But it's also important, I think, because it heals. We know that people who have a lot of social support live longer, they're healthier. And again here I think an example from art is important. It's the same image, but from a Spielberg movie, E.T., the extraterrestrial, where Thomas befriends a strange little puppet, Thomas, the main character. He finds E.T., he brings him home, he takes care of him. And at a particular time, I think the defining moment in that movie is that when Thomas hurts his finger, it bleeds, and E.T. reaches out to him and heals him. And with a little Spielberg finger, with a little light bulb, he reaches out to Thomas and he touches him and the finger is healed. So that's what social connection does. And we all cry and we say, oh, beautiful, and we see the film over and over again and it's a millions making machine. So social connection also makes us vulnerable. When you truly connect to others, you're vulnerable. From a distance, it's easy to shout and scream and judge and say people are wrong or they're terrible or whatever. But if you meet them in person, when you talk to them, when you see their emotions, when you see their non-verbal behavior, when you know that they're actually existing, that's when they're vulnerable. You have to be vulnerable. And when you're vulnerable, you can actually connect and you can learn and you can teach each other something. So that's why social connection, I think, is important. And of course, I guess for a social psychologist, the most important reason why social connection, social contact is important because of this vulnerability. It's the breaker, the, uh, the scissor for stereotyping, for prejudice. Prejudice exists, people have all kinds of images on people on the news, on television, they read about, they have all these images and, and, and stereotypes. But when you meet these people, when you bring particular groups, Moroccans and Dutch people, other Dutch people, or Surinamers, homosexuals and heterosexuals, you have all kinds of images about each other. 
But when we meet each other, we see that these stereotypes break. And there are two famous examples from the sociology literature. The first is that in World War II, North American uh, soldiers, for the first time they fought together with black, black and whites fought together. And there were platoons with all whites and there were platoons with blacks, blacks and whites together. And the stereotyping, the prejudice of the whites against the blacks was amazingly high, this was the 40s, in the all white platoons, and it was amazingly low in the mixed platoons, because these people were in contact with each other, they, they, they fought together, they knew each other, they get to know, they got to know each other. Another famous example is the Robbers Cave experiment, where social psychologists take Boy Scouts to a summer camp and they make two groups, that need to, and then the two groups are then competing against each other. They're competing against each other for all kinds of silly games. And they hate each other. They start calling each other names. The prejudice immediately blossoms. When you put two people in two, when you put two groups, uh, put, uh, when you put people in two groups, you have stereotyping, you have prejudice. And then the only thing the researchers did was bring these groups together again, put them in contact, have them sit on the table. And almost immediately, in one or two days, all the stereotypes, all the prejudice, all the name calling, all the naming and shaming and flaming disappeared. So that's why contact is important. It makes us human, it heals, and it breaks stereotypes and makes prejudice go away. At least that's what some sociologists say. Is that obvious? Yeah. It's one of the open doors of social psychology. But again, I think that doesn't mean it's not, not important. We live in a global village. Village. We can see everything and everybody on our screens, on our iPads, iPhones, we have everything. And everybody's there, everybody's connected. Really? I'm not sure. In this world of fast social media, there's a lot of images, likes and dislikes. We judge. We say, oh, I like that, oh, I dislike that. We have immediate impressions. We quick and dirty judgments of other people. But we forget to connect. And I think that's why this is a great idea, the social coupé. Normally when you're on a train, everybody's behind his iPhone, behind his iPad or your smartphone, and we're looking at the screen and we're SMSing small, strange, not flawless Dutch texts. It's a great idea to actually talk to each other, to reach out to open up and to get to know each other, so that you know someone instead of only knowing of someone. So that's what I learned and tried to do. Not quick and dirty, not one goal, but multiple goals. Stop, take your time, listen to the other, and then talk. And that's how images of anyone, stereotypes, prejudices, and misunderstandings are born and maybe go away. And that's the, one of the things I've learned so far. Not to lose myself anymore. To get in touch and converse and communicate with myself, with my moral principles, my emotions, the things that are important that I learned from my parents, from my society. And to stop, to listen and to talk. To listen carefully and to love deeply. That's my goal in life my most important goal, among all the other goals, like caring for my children, having fun, and trying to make the world a better place in 2050. That's what I lost, and that's what I learned. Thank you very much.